as a nation, we have no option but to sustain the peace we are enjoying in order to broaden the frontiers of our democracy and development. At no point in time should we take the peace we are enjoying for granted. Our fallen heroes and founding fathers toiled to give us this dear nation, and we dare not destroy what we have toiled to build. Professor John Evans Atamils on 6th March 2012. Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Philip Ebobonzi Simpson, Rector of Gimpa. His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, former President of Ghana. Our eminent speaker, Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajiman, the Dean of the Law Faculty Gimpa, Professor Sir Justice Dennis Dominic Ajay, all dignitaries, all protocols observed. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Today, indeed, is a great day. Seven years ago, GEMPA, in collaboration with the government of Ghana and the University of Cape Coast, came into this partnership to remember, to celebrate a great man. And that is why we are here today. Last year, this time, we found ourselves in Cape Coast, and probably next year it will be in Cape Coast. But it moves from Cape Coast, between Cape Coast and GEMPA. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to have the national anthem, and it will be led by the Winneba Youth Choir. Shall we be standing now, please? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. Thank you. We will have the opening prayer, and this will be done by Reverend Maurice Macaulay. A round of applause for him as he comes, please, ladies and gentlemen. Shall we pray? Father, we should express our gratitude to you for gathering us here this afternoon to deliberate on yet another important national issue. And once we gather there here, we humbly pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide us through this program. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. I would like to invite a colleague of mine to introduce the chairman for this occasion, Ms. Georgia A.J., Corporate Affairs Gimpa. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. All protocols observed. Welcome to the seventh commemorative lecture of a past African leader, Professor John Evans Atta Mills. Born to Dr. and Mrs. Bonzi Simpson, the chairman attended Infansipim 
and St. John's and universities at Lagoon, Saskatchewan, Toronto and Cape Coast. He is a barrister and solicitor, professor of law, founding dean of the University of Cape Coast Faculty of Law and currently the rector, Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. He is married and has five sons. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of this lecture is Professor Philip Ebobonzi Simpson. With a round of applause, please invite him to the podium. Thank you very much, Mr. J. Sitting where I was sitting, I had the opportunity of surveying the audience and permit me and my protocols to recognize His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, the immediate past president of the Republic of Ghana. <laughs> permit me also to recognize the chairman and the General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress. <laughs> My own teacher, legal methods, legal systems, and jurisprudence, Professor Kwame Nahoy, <laughs> who once upon a time and still is with us here in spirit, and his brother, who I see across on the other aisle. I also recognize my chairman of council at the time I was a member of the council of the University of Cape Coast, Nana Sam Ru Butler. I recognize the former vice chancellor of the university at which I pursued my first degree, Professor Akilak Pasoya, counterpart, vice chancellor, from his sister university, Professor Joshua Alabi, and his wife, Professor Koski Alabi. The others in the crowd that I presently haven't identified, and please forgive me if I haven't presently mentioned your name, but you're all duly appreciated. This serves as my protocols. And I welcome all of you here on behalf of the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration to the seventh edition of these commemorative lectures. Not only do I welcome you here to a very auspicious institution for a very auspicious occasion, I do have a personal connection with the person we are celebrating and remembering. He was my lecturer in commercial law. He was my lecturer in company law. And as circumstances will have it, in due course, I myself pursued both practice and scholarship in company law and its administration. So, Professor John Ivan Satamels, a lecturer, a sportsman, a statesman, and a former president of the republic means much to me personally and indeed means much to everybody associated with Ghana because of who he is and what he did. Seven years ago to the date less six days, his goodly spirit departed to serve in the courts above. Before we invite in due course the lecturer to come and deliver the commemorative lecture, may I respectfully invite all of us in his honor and his memory to rise to give him a fitting tribute of silence. So, 
Empress Ajayya Mills. And the souls of all faithful departed rest in the bosom of the Almighty. Amen. Please resume your seats. We are here to commemorate our departed former president and he is associated with others in different roles. Former teacher, former colleague at the workplace, former colleague in politics, father, husband, and the like. To commemorate this, a lecture will be delivered on a topic. He was himself an educationist who through his working life used and endeavored to use education as a vehicle for development. It is therefore appropriate as we commemorate his memory to invite an educationist to speak to the matter and to speak to the matter of education. We know education is the key to development. We know education is key in the sustainable development goals. In the African Uni Union Agenda 2063, and in the Continental Education Strategy for Africa. But where does Ghana fit in all of this? And how? Can we harness our human resources to ensure national development? The person carefully selected to deliver this is a person very well known to us. In a little while, I'll be reading out her profile. Very rich and no doubt establishing her as a fitting candidate to present. But before that, let me mention that she was my senior colleague and, colleague and, and boss at the University of Cape Coast, where I was a lecturer, and she was a vice chancellor. <laughs> in the course of time, she became the boss of the vice chancellor, indeed the boss of the boss of the vice chancellor, and we are speaking about no other person who is currently the chancellor of the Women's University in Africa, a professor of literature at the School of Humanities and Legal Studies of the University of Cape Coast, president and Africa board chair of the Forum for African Women Educationists. This person has been minister of education here in Ghana Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, the first woman to hold the position of Vice Chancellor in Ghana indeed. At the University of Cape Coast, she has been Hall Warden, Head of Department of English, Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Dean of the Board of Graduate Studies and Founding Dean of the School of Graduate Studies and Research. Professor Pukwejman holds a Bachelor of Arts degree with honors in French and English a diploma in education also from the same university at Cape Coast, a diploma superior d'études Francaise from the University of Dakar, Senegal, Master of Arts and PhD degrees from York University in Canada. She has worked at the levels of policy and practice in education and has attracted extensive recognition at both national and international fronts. She is a recipient of many many awards, including but not limited to the following. She's an officer of the Order of the Volta, outstanding contributions to education in the Commander traditional area, outstanding performance in, in advancing international education, School for International Training in USA. She possesses a Bachelor of, a Doctor of Laws degree honoris causa from the University of West Indies, Barbados, Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa from Winston-Salem University, Doctor Humane Letters 
Honoris Causa, Grand Valley State University, Michigan, USA. Doctor of Letters, Honoris Causa, University of Cape Coast. Global Leadership Award, University of South Florida, USA. Al Sumait Award in Education on behalf of FAWE, and that is a safer way of pronouncing this, whether it's for or far we, I've avoided it. <laughs> Outstanding contributions to education by Africa Education Leadership Awards, Mauritius. We can therefore see not only is she distinguished, she has merited all these awards. She has served on many boards, including the Center for Democratic Development in Ghana, Executive Board of UNESCO, Global Advisory Board of the Global Education Monitoring Report of UNESCO, Global Advisory Council, Weldon and Incorporated USA, on the Auditorial Board of the Harriet Tubman Series on African Diaspora, the Africa Initiative Canada, Adam Matthew, and others. Professor Nana Jane Opokwa Jaman has published in areas of literature by women from Ghana. In oral literature in Ghana and Africa, communicative skills and issues in the African diaspora. Her creative effort in literature has resulted in a five volume collection of pub published folk tales titled, Who Told the Most Incredible Story? She's a two time senior Fulbright scholar fellow of the Institute of Advanced Study and Research into the African Humanities of Northwestern University in Illinois, a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a life fellow of the Commonwealth of Learning. Professor Pukwa Jaman is blessed with three adult children and two adorable grandchildren. She doesn't look like Grandmother is so pretty, she will easily pass for someone entering <laughs> marriage. But when you combine the spirit of God with dedicated service to the nation, you can be aging with grace and no one will tell you are a grandmother. Her hobbies include reading, listening to music, and cooking. On the latter score, I'm inviting my help, myself to fancy fancy. <laughs> On an appropriate occasion, we will invite our distinguished lecturer to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chairman for the occasion and rector of GIMPA, Professor Bonzi Simpson, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And audience, if there was anything he said you liked, give thanks to God. If there's anything you didn't like, pass it on to me. I know he's done many um, recognitions, but I would like to emphasize His Excellency, the former President, John Dramani Mahama. Thank you very much for being here. Actually, I didn't expect that you'd be here. Knowing where you've been the last couple of days, I'm very grateful. I also acknowledge the Dean of the Faculty of Law, uh, the Chairman, the General Secretary, all members of the National Executive Committee of the National Democratic Congress, all supporters, everyone in this room, my colleagues, my friends, my dear students, where are you? How many students are here? I'm happy to see you here. And if I haven't mentioned your name, please consider yourself individually identified and recognized and I thank you for coming this afternoon. And I suppose I should, uh, I should add all protocols observed. <laughs> so I've done so. Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, do allow me to begin on a personal note. The story begins in the holy city of Kisi. You know I'm in literature, so we like to tell stories. It begins in the holy city of Kisi, near Komenda. Commander, which is my beloved hometown. Commander is famed for a very active sugar factory in the days of Kwame Nkrumah and beyond. And this factory produced healthy cane sugar, which unfortunately collapsed. Commander now sits at the forecourt of our minds, reminding us of a new cane sugar factory that patiently listens daily 
to changing narratives on why it was duly constructed in Tehran, and yet now merely sits and waits, unsure of the next twist in the story of this unpardonable idleness. At a personal level, the two towns, Kisi and Komenda, easily move in and out, or out of each other's orbit and connect many families, including mine and the family of His Excellency John Evans Atta Mills, the man of peace whose memory we observe through this event, which is dubbed the John Evans Atta Mills Memorial Lectures. I don't think anyone expected in those days that I would be privileged to deliver a lecture in his memory. But such is, as we might say, the hand of God. I have no memory of him as a child then, nor indeed of his siblings then, but I have very fond memories of his mother, a matronly figure who loved children. One of the attractions for my siblings and I to go and spend time in the home of our grandfather, who was a postmaster in Kisi then, was to run across the street from his home to this lady's shop. She must have sold many items of little interest to me as a child. What I remember was that she lived the gift of giving, of sharing, as she never failed to freely share a welcoming smile and give us biscuits. Her husband, I was to learn much later, was a tutor at the Commander Training College, teaching many to become effective teachers. And teaching, I submit, is the most important profession of all. And it was much later that I met his other brother, Dr. Cadman Atamils, when he worked with the UNDP in Senegal. I'd gone to that country as an undergraduate to spend a year abroad as a student of French. I later on got to know one of his sisters, Mrs. Afo, that legendary mathematics teacher of Ola Training College then, and in whose home mine and other children, after receiving piano lessons as co-curricular activities, would prepare for their music exams organized then at the British Council. Mrs. Alfol is known for taking out the fear of mathematics from those teacher trainees who were not particularly fond of the subject and finally enabling everyone to learn. His other sister, Mrs. Kwashi, and her husband, Professor Kwashi, are my very affable church mates at the Emmanuel Methodist Church, Ola Estes, Cape Coast. And his other brother, Honorable Samuel Atamils, is the MP for KEA, my home constituency. The nature of Professor Atta Mills, a professor of law, an economist, who later became our beloved president, I submit, translates the image of a peace-loving, law-abiding, and an embracing personality coming from a welcoming family that believed in and supported the larger aims of education. And education, of course, is a fulcrum of all aspects of development hinged on good governance. The subject of the attainment of peace through education, thus forms the basis of my presentation for today, threading the presentation by a string of strategies that we deployed under His Excellency John Ramani Mahama's term to embrace those in the margins, those already left out and potential candidates who might be left behind the train of education. Before I proceed, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, do allow me to, pro to express my gratitude to the organizers for bestowing such an honor on me. I'm truly thankful and humbled by the gesture. I thank everyone. I recognize everyone and every government that has come before the one led by His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, which kept the torch of quality education ablaze. Education, as the Western derived, was given a huge boost by our founding president, Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and kept alight by His Excellency John Evans Atta Mills. His Excellency Mahama invited some, including my team and I, to serve in his government. I use this opportunity to speak to how, under his tenure, we considered and practiced the multidisciplinary sector of education and the results that ensued. The contents I'm about to share has been the result of collaborative effort of all our agencies in education, some 20 of them. My very able deputies, Honorable Samoku Jeto Ablakwa, Honorable Alex Treme, all the directors of education, including the chief director, governor, our partners, 
all of who supported us in this quest. This is also the time to acknowledge colleagues, family, friends, and, and those who expressed appreciation and encouragement during the time we were privileged to serve in the Ministry of Education. And of course, all thanks to you, Your Excellency John Mahama, for the support, for the abiding faith, and for the trust you had in us. We conceived, we conceived that by creating the environment for everyone to access quality education, the nation would very well be on the road to sustain peace. Sustainable development as an objective must, after all, work towards the aim of achieving social equity, equality, and most important of all, sustainable peace. Education is the key to development. I was happy to hear the chairman say so. We have heard this statement. Maybe this is a tired statement. It should be compulsorily retired by now. But this truth has defied retirement and continues to apply still. The objective of de development, good governance, quality education, and more, arguably have one big aim of achieving peace in the society and ultimately in the world. Perhaps this drive towards social concord will account for why we all understand that education is a fundamental human right, a way of inducting the youth into life's flow, the anchor of democracy, the pathway to progress and development. Education is the best inheritance any nation can be bequeath to its youth. Development is about every discipline, and therefore education is also about every discipline. It is also, I believe, about knowing who we truly are and who we can become as Ghanaians. Each of these must form part of, our, of the forward march, if only because each depends on relevant quality education that liberates the mind from dogma and unexamined options. Above all, education must create the environment that allows the mind to continuously create new ways of dealing with existing and emerging issues, also known as critical thinking, creativity, innovation. Do allow me to clarify that education is not only one type or kind. Or kind. When we conceive of, of education in a holistic manner, it takes into cognizance how it benefits the whole person, physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, and more. We move beyond the fixation on the recently inherited Western-style classroom-type education to include all indigenous, non-formal, formal, lifelong, and if I may add, life-wide too. By using all the branches and allowing flexibility for adaptation and change, focusing on any one level of education to the detriment of others or roping the others in as afterthought is to set the stage for unnecessary confusion with huge social costs. There is the need for a nationally shared and articulated vision of how we wish to see our country. What should Ghana look like in 20 years? What should Ghana look like by the time we get to the AU 2063? How have we run things that created the problems that we seek to change? For example, what are the changes in thinking, planning, execution, evaluation, and outcomes that, man, that must necessarily form the basis of any intervention that will add value to our lives as a nation? These questions, addressing the issues in this critical sector of education in both horizontal and vertical ways, and in relation with other sectors might lead to reforms that work towards sustained peace through relevant education. Perhaps this is an outstanding national referendum. Fortunately, we have starting points. They include the Africa we want 2063, the 2057 Ghana we want very ably provided by the National Development Planning Commission led by Dr. Nimoy Thompson, the SDGs, the MDGs, and so on. And the Agenda 2063, developed by the AU, is something we need to take very, very seriously. It is most significant to note that Agenda 2063 has been echoed in the SDGs as part of a commitment to achieving sustainable development in three dimensions, economic, social, and environmental, in a balanced and integrated manner. Education could well position itself at the forefront of supporting these processes in various dimensions. My own observation and convictions are that a Pan-African approach might better aid the continent in making progress with the goals. 
we must foster strong intercontinental linkages, supporting the AU to spearhead this forward march, even as we deepen our relationships with other parts of the world. I suggest we use such programs to interrogate our borders and seriously continue to affect the events that keep us apart and down on the path of non-peace. It is not for nothing that the Asian, South American, and European Union agenda and others have long-term plans in all their sectors, including education, to which each country responds. Such unified platforms must undoubtedly have influenced their participation and formulation of the goals, both MDGs and SDGs. Commitments of governments of Ghana to education has been commendable, if not outright admirable. Ghana consistently beats the UNESCO recommended 20% of national budgetary allocation for education. Ghana is a leader in this vein. And even in the time of Kwame Nkrumah, we did 40%. And it was in 1962 under Kwame Nkrumah that f -cube was abolished, sorry, was introduced, that he abolished school fees known as tuition for public schools, including universities. Successive governments have played their roles, providing well above the required 20% to the sector. In the time of JDM, I think we did 32 or 34, we, we, we went very high. The country has a right to demand better results for this heavy investment. And I believe that the public has not been too disappointed. We have a good education system, but we should work to make it better and not worse. One way is through inclusion and diversification. The public has received many reforms. It is about time to pause and reflect on these effects. Our, our reforms appear fraught with inconsistencies, persistent adjustments that cry out for a deepening of sober reflection. These reforms seem to leave out the fundamental question of who we are and where we are heading. Our planning will have to take that into consideration. Reforming education so often, especially after power has changed hands, and restricting the reforms to one level only has not been very helpful. Any policy intervention is as good as how carefully it is thought through, how it is meticulously and strategically planned, how that policy is logically implemented, how it effectively connects all, to all levels and types, in this case of education, how it is scientifically evaluated and fine-tuned, and how sustainably it supports the beneficiaries themselves and the nation at large. Since the days of Gagisbeg, Ghana has had more than 13 reforms in education. While one can appreciate the interest and need to tilt inherited systems to current needs, those needs, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, will always be current. We need to envision future needs in the reforms. Ghana's educational reforms are too many. The revolving doors of reforms move too swiftly. There are, these are usually not accompanied by systemic evaluations born out of somber deeply reflected research that can aid policymakers to make the right interventions. For example, for what economy, society, future are we educating the young today? Some, if not too many of our policy interventions are based on perceptions about falling academics and moral standards. And you know, for the old people, the standards are always falling. Isn't that the case? The good old education we had, the big English that brings nothing, too much grammar in the education, not enough skills and technical and so on, the education and so on. Others are affected because the power to do so exists. Just to demonstrate that, quote, I disagreed with you all along and now I have the muscle to make the change. Such must stop. Education begins at the foundational level and nowhere else, where the citizens can truly be left behind and create the ingredients for non-peace. The quality of instruction at the basic level, for example, is of utmost importance at the ensuing levels. The general markets of quality education include the following, but not limited to them. Quality of teacher training. And here we're talking about the trainers, the facilities, the programs used, entry characteristics of the trainees, relevant curricula, innovative and appropriate methodologies, learning materials that truly respond to the level of the learner, 
images that derive from the way the learner sees the world. The building blocks of quality education include a congenial, non-threatening learning environment, space, respect for the growing mind, relevant support of parents, guardians, traditional and community leaders who have been respectively and effectively roped into the system of education to partner efficiently with other stakeholders. All of these and others ensure that learners go to school, enjoy being in school, stay in school, move on and to achieve their potential as, and as a consequence, raise the quality of learning outcomes. It is in the spirit of leaving no child behind, quality education, that at the time of His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, the Minister of Education introduced the Best School Award, for example. This was aimed at building strong relationships that focus on the environment. We were interested in the state of the classrooms and the washrooms, general sanitation of the school, the state of the playground, the quality of instruction and evaluation, the relationship between teacher and people, between teachers and heads of schools, between teaching and non-teaching staff, between pupils and non-teaching staff, between school and MMDAs, relationship among teachers, the nature of infrastructure and general state of the school compound. This, we thought, should complement the Best Teacher Award. It is within these intangibles we conceived that real inclusion and quality might be located. We agreed that instead of throwing money at a problem, it was better to carefully launch a strategy to mitigate that problem. For example, while monetary compensation is important, and who would disagree with that, one might ask how much teacher motivation in monetary terms was going to make it easy for one teacher to teach 110 year olds in her class every day of the week with just 20 textbooks or less, vary her teaching methodology to suit the learning needs of each child, provide emotional support, grade their homework regularly, be kind to them, be alert all day while taking breaks under trees and while taking care of her own needs. I'll be very happy to get the figure. Therefore, increasing the textbook ratio from the national average of one textbook, that's what we found. We increased it from one textbook to three children to four textbooks to every child. And President Mahama, the children of Ghana may never have known who did this because we were doing the work of God and they thank you for it. We also ensured that we move beyond the number of limit. There was a constant number of trained teachers that were coming out of our colleges of education every year, even though we had a youthful population. So any government that is interested in the youth must pay attention to the teacher pupil ratio. We were also able to reduce the number of teachers who regularly absented themselves. We are confronted with a national average of 27% in January 2013. When we exited in December 2016, we had managed to bring this down to 7%. <laughs> These were all interventions towards quality outcomes and ensuring that leaving no child behind did not rest at the level of a refrain. To our delight, after these interventions, strengthening management and so on, bringing in the DCs and, and, and so on, everybody, the municipal chief executives, they were instrumental and I want to thank them. To our delight, the results began to show much, much earlier than we had anticipated. In 2014, 11 students scored 500 and more in the BEC. You know the highest will be 600 of the six subjects, meaning that no child made any mistake, which we know is not possible, okay? And for a long time, no Ghanaian child had gotten 500. And I think the highest, one person had got it before, but subsequently being 4984, and especially when we saw 499. And we wonder, so what, where was that one mark? Anyway. But in 2014, we were very happy when 11 students scored 500 and more. And the highest was 507. In 2015, we declined, but we still made the mark. Two students scored 500 and above, and the highest was 504. 
When we exited 2016, we did so with the best BEC results ever in the history of this country. We had 3,994 students scoring 500 and more, the highest being 564. And if you'll also pay attention to the President's Award for BEC graduates, you'll notice over the past, we did our homework, we went further, further, further back from 92 when the award was, uh, was instituted. And we saw that most of the people who were awarded were from public schools. And I said, well, why wouldn't parents send their children to private schools? No, most of the recipients were people from the private schools. But we thought that every child can learn and every child is capable, and simply because they're in public schools doesn't mean they can't do it. So all these interventions you know, helped everyone. And in 2016, when the President's Awards were conducted, for the first time, out of the 20 recipients, 13 came from the basic public schools. So this is to say that if we all put our attention there, we get many, many more people who are doing well, and God knows we all need them. But, in, you know, all the classrooms and the environment and the teachers and books and so on aside, important though they are, the most important ingredient of all, as far as I'm concerned, is the language in which the child is taught. I know I have to tread cautiously here because of the importance of language and the emotive connotations that any discussion of the use of our languages in schools usually raises. Do forgive me if I grate on your last nerve. I don't intend to do so. At the risk of quoting myself, let me restate that when you teach a child in a language she does not understand, in which the, his parents don't speak, which the community hardly communicates in, to teach a child in a language that some of his teachers themselves even sometimes have basic challenges with, and which as a result acts as a barrier to learning. You get, one, you get two results. One is to alienate the child from education. That's the best result you can get. And the worst is to miseducate the child. Surely we don't send our children for those outcomes. Are we surprised that they'll stay in school for nine years and they still can't read anything? There are solutions and we try them. Language must facilitate, not ask act as a stumbling block to learning. The issue of language, then, is very important. And I can always hear the counter arguments. The last time I raised the issue with a friend, he asked me, so how would you translate photosynthesis into fancy? <laughs> I had the occasion to remind him that though it's a two words coming from both Latin and Greek, and that actually they are not even English words. But so they were borrowed. And I also asked him, so if, if he was a Christian, he said yes. And I said, have you read your Bible well? He said yes. I said, no problem. So do you think that we can translate the Bible from Genesis to Revelations? And we can't translate a textbook for a primary three child into his own language. Of course, our discussions ended with the fact that after years of indefatigable efforts of the Académie Française to keep the French language pure from borrowing, that French could not insulate the language from its natural dynamic form. Today we can find many non-French diction in, our, in the French language. And when we are sending money, send it mere. Isn't that what we say? Uh -huh. So we've adopted send into our local language. And is anybody taking us to court for that? Okay. More on the complementary basic later, but it is instructive to report that after two years of teaching the students in the complementary basic section in Ghanaian languages for nine months, they had covered two years' syllabus. I had the pleasure of visiting some of these classes. In the cases where I had not shared the local language, the atmosphere itself was electrifying. The joy in the faces of the young learners was infectious, and learner participation was absolute. How does the teacher achieve student-centered learning when the children have no clue what is going on. I have so many examples, but we'll, keep, we'll save them for another day. So we say that our children chew and pour, isn't that, and forget. Why wouldn't they? Rote learning is a direct consequence of material not intellectually digested, or simply put, not understood. 
studying past questions that were said before the learner was born is to educate the, our youth in a sadly backward direction. If we want children to use knowledge they have acquired, they must first comprehend what is being taught. The side effect we hoped of using the local language at the foundational levels and in the CBE was for the child to positively affect their parents' own level of literacy because the child would be reading in a language the parents understood. So you see the vicarious benefit of raising the levels of literacy. These otherwise non-reading parents of orthographic material might begin to feel closer to and value what their children were learning and even participate. I believe they'll be more active at PTAs instead of waiting to see how much more are we going to pay. Don't we find it odd that after using English for hundreds of years, many of our children still cannot easily pass the subject and that poor comprehension in English accounts for poor results in most subjects and subsequently poor performance outcomes. There is enough research done to demonstrate that those with strong L1, that's your first language, are those who learn other languages better. I wish to be contradicted by a linguist in the field. To begin educating any person with the L2 or others is to set the stage for poor results. This must change through a carefully introduced and guided national conversation in order to make everyone feel that his or language does count. We, are keenly, we were keenly aware that such children who fell out would never benefit from any form of education, progressively free or not, unless strategic interventions were applied at the basic from preschool to GHS. Therefore, under the Early Childhood Care and Development Program, we increase access to this by providing more facilities, improving teacher quality and learning outcomes by raising the number of qualified teachers. We made progress as evidenced by the following performance indicators. In fulfillment of his commitment to allocate more resources to early child education and development, between 2013 and 16, we increased expenditure from average of 3.8% to average of 6.5%. The resources enable government to recruit and pay more teachers at this level and also provide you know, new buildings, rehabilitate existing ones, provide furniture, and so on. In order to ensure that teachers in early childhood receive specialized, specialized skills in delivery of quality teaching and learning at that level, the ministry through the NCTE established special schools in seven out of the 40, 43 colleges of education. Ola at Cape Coast, Presbyterian at Eburi, SZA at Sokore, St. Louis in Kumase, Tamale College of Education, Jasakan College, and Tumu College. And these were to specially train them for the KG. We did not want a situation where the teacher who couldn't cope with class two is asked to go to class one because different skills might be required there. It is also instructive to note that whereas in 2008 and 9, 31.3% of teachers engaged in public schools were trained, by the time we exited, we had raised this figure from 31.3 to 65.9. The gender parity index also improved from 0 0.99 in 2009 to 1.1 in 2015-16. Ghana's Population and house, Housing Census 2010 tells us that 540,127 children from ages 6 to 14 either dropped out of school or never even entered due to many, many factors. And shows that no child was abandoned. The ministry gave blessings and support to the complementary basic education program through development and approval of a policy to guide its operations, a move which is consistent with the existing strategic plan and the one we left for the ministry, which was the 2016 to 2030 strategic plan. And these mandate the state to attend to the educational needs of all children, including the vulnerable and excluded, especially those in hard to reach areas, by focusing on basic life skills, literacy, numeracy. 
And we, our target was 70% um, success, but we were very happy to note in 2014-15 that we hit 92.86%, and in 2015-16, we hit a target of 92.6%. And in every case, the girls studied, and we were able to mainstream them into the regular school system. And we acknowledge all funders and participants. And our CBE is, was deemed to have met international best practices. We had countries including Burkina Faso, Mali, Egypt, India, Bangladesh, also reported to have bought into this concept and practice. Another group that was likely to be left behind were those differently abled and talented. Under the inclusive and special education program, basic schools in 48 districts across all the then 10 uh, regions practice inclusive education in their premises. And we were also able to develop the policy. Therefore, we trained heads, circuit supervisors, deputy directors, uh, basic schools were screened for vision and hearing and other needs wheelchairs were distributed to physically challenged pupils, an inclusive, edu inclusive education policy, including an implementation plan, as I've said, was developed and launched. So at the basic level, it became apparent that many of those who did not pass their BEC at the first time were not returning to their schools to attempt to improve their previous grades. Effective strategy was put in place to ensure that these fellow citizens were not left behind, that they were aided to effectively participate in the development of the country. So despite the, the negative publicity that it wasn't going to happen, the first year we had 1,181 participants, you know, candidates writing, and in the second year, 1,413 to redeem themselves and to go back to school. And it was so, it was touching just watching these adults, you know, BEC was introduced a long time ago, and some just never had a chance. In our effort to accelerate ICT education at the basic level, 81,000 basic school teachers were trained from 2013 to 16 to enable them acquire the requisite skills in the use of ICT to facilitate teaching and learning. More than 54,500 laptops were procured and, and distributed to basic school teachers. You know, when we talked about uh, laptops for children, we forgot that you need to start with the teachers. So we stepped in and filled that gap. We will have to explain how we integrated ICT into the teaching at the basic level at another presentation. Otherwise, we'll be here for too long. Now, the Muhammad-led administration had promised to construct new secondary schools because access had become a huge setback. In order to implement this intention, we turned the whole intervention into a project which we called Secondary Education Improvement Project because we wanted to see the entire spectrum of, of, of the entire level of what it was that we needed to fix. At the point of concept, we ensured that access would work hand in hand with quality. We didn't think we should do access and then later on wonder where quality was. Our focus was to extend existing secondary schools while constructing new ones and in so doing, bring the reality of a youthful bulge into, in our population to our attention and to the forecourt of our minds. We knew poor students needed help, that poor girl students needed special support due to their distinctive biological functioning. We made provision in the form of a scholarship package that was to go to girls to take care of their sanitary needs at certain times. And as Ghanaians will say, come and see. <laughs> Nothing in the 125-page document, ironically called the PAD. At the ministry, we called it the PAD because the PAD was project appraisal document. Nothing in this 125-page document that contained the ingredients for the blueprint. 300 copies of which we had zeros for every member of parliament. None of this excited our friends on the other side of the speaker more than the reference to supporting girls 
during their menstrual periods. Most of you remember the infamous press conferences about pampers, the unsavory epithets carelessly flung about because we were paying attention to the area of retention of girls in secondary schools. Many ironies have ensued. One of them is that one of the members of the then minority who had spoken against and voted against the project during the press conference ended up on video claiming to have lobbied for one of the schools that was part of the project her party had rejected. A second irony, those of us who were privileged to be present at the recent 2019 Women Deliver Conference in Vancouver, Canada, and I was privileged to be part of it, especially at the opening of the World Conference, when everybody was there, all the UN agencies, the funders, all the big names named them. This happened on June 3, 2019. Those of you who were there will recall the huge applause that His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta received when he announced that an intervention that has worked in favor of the retention of girls in secondary schools in Kenya has been the provision of sanitary towels to girls. A third, as fate will have it, my team and I initiated discussions with the World Bank to extend the facility to provide more scholarships to all needy pupils, but especially to needy girls, at the time when our evaluation has scored very high marks with the institution and when we, when we were about to leave office. In the name of transparency, principle, and conviction, I expected a rejection and a press conference to the effect when the loan was approved. It was, it was indeed interesting, to put it mildly, when in December 2017, the extension was granted for same purposes, including sanitary parts. And this time, it was gleefully accepted by those who have seen it fit to ri ridicule the idea. And this time also with no fuss, no social media protests about pampas, no artist impressions about types of sanitary parts that exist. I didn't know there were so many varieties. No press conferences, no newspaper articles, no name calling, and more importantly, no insults. So much for objectivity and principles. And please, when I was, people said, oh, this is only politics, you know. And I said, I think we need a new name for this kind of behavior. And that politics will not do. If my name were policies, I will seriously complain. But on a more serious note, the joy and benefits will all be ours as a nation when better conceived interventions that truly leave no one behind are designed, when clearly thought through strategies for quality improvements are promoted, and much better when relevant and appealing infrastructure is bequeathed to our youth. If we truly believe that the youth are the future of our beloved nation, we must take steps that address their needs. Between 2012 and 2016, Ghana topped WAYEK in four consecutive years, making history. <laughs> Ghana consistently came first in four straight years, something that had never happened in the history of Wayek. Former President, you should be very proud of yourself. <laughs> Our thanks to the teachers, the parents, support staff, and of course to the students themselves. Interventions at this level must bear this record in mind. Please keep it at this level at worst and improve on it at best. The introduction of progressively free SHS was to target the needy, avoid unnecessary hardship to students, parents, and teachers, and at worst set the stage for poorer results. It was upon careful study that we started with students from the day secondary schools and decided to make the community day schools attractive in both form and content. Gratitude to everyone, those from the statistical department, your patience is appreciated if you are here, to the Ministry of Gender and Children's Affairs, especially to the then Minister Nana Oye, I don't know if you are here. I'm always thankful for your wonderful cooperation in sharing data. The schools have 24 classrooms, eight offices for heads of departments, well-fitted computer laboratories with relevant material on the hard drive, spacious and well-stocked libraries, four science lab 
laboratories, offices for the headmaster and support staff, staff room, and so on. Our vision was to deepen the diversification of secondary education to cater for different strengths and interests. And we did so by taking TVET as seriously as we could. Therefore, at the senior secondary level, we extended access and deepened quality through retraining and re-equipping of teachers and support staff, retooling of science, computer, and other laboratories, refurbishing the libraries, expanding the existing infrastructure, and constructing our famous e-blocks that some chose to christen them the Mahama Secondary Schools. In all of this, we kept our eyes on inclusion, paying special attention to the vulnerable, including girls. STEM was a point of departure in order to strengthen TVET and ensure that many did not fall through the cracks at this type of education. In a previous article, I've argued that everyone, regardless of the future choice of profession, needs some proficiency in STEM. At the core of the complex areas of vocational technical training are both science and math, especially if they are conceived and taught in ways that everybody can understand. One big, big stumbling block was to avoid the wrong-headed perception that TVET is the preserve of those who cannot meet academic standards. This is classes, is self-defeating, is exclusionist, it's an effective way of leaving many behind and it will not lead to any development. Nowhere did this unhelpful awareness become apparent a long time ago than when the junior secondary school concept was scaled up after 13 years of piloting. Even some in education acted like they did not know about the existence of, this, of the piloting effort. Some parents rushed to take their children out of the system because they did not want them to become artisans. Some parents who are happy to use and even show off expensive furniture, cars, clothing, jewelry, work gadgets, building material, even fresh fruits and vegetables, and other food items, shoes, and so on, produced by artisans in other countries. It is not paradoxical, is it not paradoxical that chocolate, furniture, good ju gold jewelry, is produced and sold in countries that do not produce their primary commodities. We must continue to walk the talk about adding value to our primary commodities, and TVET is a, is a door that will, be, that will open to make this possible. <laughs> Therefore, as I have hinted, we found perception the hardest of all the bridges to cross. So we set to work on it, conscious that it will take much longer than the time we had to effectively challenge. But we thought we should start anyway. Education doesn't end because somebody has left. Our response was to advance steps taken in the past by many to stimulate events by confronting the unattractive perceptions because it is at this very juncture, as Shakespeare will express it, I hear the rub. We did not think that it was enough to complain and even admit that as a nation, we do not have enough expertise to transform our natural resources into palpable wealth. We also thought it wasn't enough to convince ourselves that we are rich in natural resources when we continue to experience unforgivable levels of deprivation. Important technical know-how had become so acceptable that we had all but assumed that it was normal. This raises the question, how do others grow their technical skills to the extent that they can export them to us? What should the response of education be? To what other uses can we put our training institutions? Such were the guiding questions that led us to simulate the National Apprentice Apprenticeship Program to provide skills for youth between the ages 16 and 24. Our attention did not leave those in the informal sector behind because we have a very large informal sector since they come under our trajectory through COVID. And I acknowledge the entire COVID team, Dr. De, Matthew, everyone, you were very, very effective. Therefore, we had over 5,000 JHS leavers trained in garment making, cosmetology, welding, and fabrication. 3,500 master crafts persons themselves were trained. 10 TVET institutions were picked for refitting 
300 TVET professionals were provided with specialized training in competency-based delivery mode. And additionally, a project to develop the institutional framework for regulating informal sector apprenticeship and skills upgrading in the sector was begun. The results include 25,000 TVET learners, workers, and master craftspersons who were undergoing training. The objectives of the objective of the Ghana Skills and Technical Development Project, GSTDP, is to develop skills and technology for key sectors of our economy through improvement in quality delivery and formal training. We also had, government also established the Skills Development Fund to support and finance innovative technology and skills development. The results include 646 formal and informal businesses, trade associations, and institutions that were awarded a total of over $50 million as grants for various skills development and technology acquisition, 103,600, over 103,700 workers in the formal and informal sectors to receive training in various trade areas. We created over 13,300 13, jobs under SDF alone, we had new training courses developed and so on. The list is endless and they will all be in the published um, document. And you know, we didn't stay there. We also looked at those in electronics to ensure that they acquire the skills in servicing of LCD and LED tablets and other devices to increase and diversify their productivity. And protein-based technology was developed by the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission for controlling fruit flies in citrus farms. And as I said, the support for solar PV installation and training facility at the Ghana Telecom University allowed us to train 1,000 electricians in installation and maintenance of solar systems. Before we got to the polytechnics, we had already physically visited and studied the vocational technical schools syllabi, examined the backgrounds of their teachers, looked at the availability of uh, equipment, the methodologies used, and the results achieved. One of the conclusions reached was that the student who opted for technical drawing or construction needed to have his horizon his horizon extended beyond the secondary technical level to technical institutions, to the, to the polytechnics as was in existence, and further extend the sphere to the university. If this person so desired and was capable of adding further knowledge and skill enhancement to received education. The selection of 13 technical institutes for quality improvements and transforming our polytechnics into technical universities. Our case is in point. We picked 13 technical schools, Ada, Akwetia, Amankwa, Kruma, Swan, Siboga, Kwandung, Kranza, Dabokpa, Wa, Krobia, Sante, Takrade, and Accra. And the ministry sponsored the training of 148 instructors at the diploma level, 20 instructors at the master's level, five faculty members at the PhD level in order to enhance the quality of teaching and learning in TVET institutions. It is imperative that the instructors themselves have the highest levels of training in their respective fields as is required in any institution. A cursory look at the programs in existence then angle to deposit the learner at the low to medium level of employment was alarming. It looked like we were training personnel for jobs already being performed by machines. In other words, we were putting in money, effort, curricular planning, and so on, only to dash the dreams of applicability in terms of employment of the supposedly trained. These and others went into seriously rethinking TVET, and here too, perception became important. One response, another response was to study the syllabus to find out and, and engage others to find out what was lacking in the upward movement into university degrees. Initial trainers, 
co initial conversation with trainers and training institutions revealed that each was blaming the other. Education blamed industry for not quite appreciating their programs, what their programs were about. Industry blamed education for poor preparation of students. Master craftsmen blamed apprentices for lack of basic understanding. The apprentices not wanting to be left behind blamed their masters for high-handedness and unrealistically high expectations. So what do we do? We decided to bring everybody to the table. We organized a three-day conference called Bridging the Gap Between Education and Industry. This three-day meeting brought everyone, those in training, those who had left training, and so on. And the greatest lesson was to feel supported throughout the meeting. Even at the last day, the auditorium at the International Conference Center was still packed, and the ministry was left with a 16-point communique that it was it started implementing. So these were all part of the steps we took, including the work that was done by the search com by the committee, specially established, led by Dr. Afeti, to help us to create the, the benchmarks that will lead to a technical university. When everything was said and done, and many things were done and said, we successfully turned our polytechnics into technical, most of our polytechnics into technical universities. The Technical University Act 2016 is intended to deepen and raise the standards of technical education, clear career paths for those who choose to travel the path of vocational technical education, address academic placement and alignment in the job market, and to make technical education more relevant and attractive to everyone. There are significant achievements from all our technical universities, giving us hope with an effective integration of all the sectors of our economy. We can continue to give relevance to our lives in this country. Improvements at the technical universities began with retraining of staff, installation of learning materials, including those for renewable energy, automation and mechatronics, process control, machining, fluid, pro, fluid power and process controlling learning systems at Kumasi Ho and Takrade Technical Universities. It also included many projects, a few of which I'll read out. Construction of, of a library complex, including workshops, labs, and so on for Accra Technical University, refurbishment of the engineering block for Tamale Technical for Tamale Technical University, installation of a new mechanical engineering equipment at Koforodia Technical University, construction of a four-story hostel at Bogatanga Polytechnic, construction of an ultra-modern hotel. If we are taking tourism seriously, education has, must uh, take that also seriously. And construction of this and catering information management block and a three-story lecture hall at the Technical University. And you know, if you have time, visit any of our polytechnics. It's an exciting place to spend an afternoon or a morning. To conclude, allow me to reiterate that the thinking behind the interventions was to identify and target who were already left behind and the potential candidates who might be left behind. As a social democratic government, government, we were keen to ensure that the deprived, the hard to reach, were all pushed gradually into the center because they all matter. Allow me also to state that the focus on basic education and secondary, as I've said, the potential of our TV training and technical universities give us impetus, impetus to the rationale for this kind of transformative intervention, all aimed at raising the awareness that we are all differently gifted. The nation stands to benefit from the diversity of talents. None is more important or relevant than another, that each needs the support and appreciation of all. And perhaps this encapsulates the essence of Professor J.E.A. Mills, who wanted to embrace everyone. I end with six points. One, focusing on one link in the chain of education 
to the detriment of others is not to take education seriously. If we must learn from other countries, let us look for the best. Ghana deserves the best. When we claim some model exists elsewhere, let us find out what occasioned that model, how it is evaluated, how it was established, what was the implementation plan, how were the bottlenecks removed, what researchers are saying currently about that option, and where is that level of development for that nation. Above all, it is time we grew our own models to respond to, respond to our own situations. Let us find ways of making education the play field that everybody can play in because the, and teach to quality. Such may help us remove rote learning and to ensure that we minimize dropout rates. Four, we need a long-term development plan for our country. I've already ref referred to what was being done by Dr. Um, Nimoy Thompson and his group. Fascinating document. Reforming education without serious research into an evaluation of previous reforms is not only wasteful, it's unproductive, unresponsive, and downright destructive. As I've hinted earlier in this presentation, we need to find out how we have run the system in the past and what has created the problems that we now seek to rectify. This needs not take a lifetime. It takes an honest admission that the models we have been using forever, and that's simply patching up, revising, reviewing, fine-tuning, reshaping, may not necessarily serve our purpose. We need a true paradigm shift that embraces everyone from the margins and creates an environment that enables everyone to operate at the center. It is the duty of us all to begin and sustain this process for true, palpable, sustainable national development. Finally, education must point to the future by addressing the Ghana we must work to have. Cannot just be the Ghana we want. We can want anything we want. We should work to make it happen. So it should be the Ghana we must work to have, which must be a peaceful, confident, prosperous country. Such, I presume, will be advancing the national vision as lived by Asum Jehin, the man of peace. I thank you for your kind attention. Ladies and gentlemen, we can do better. A better round of applause for the great professor. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite the chairman for this occasion, director of this great institute, my boss, Professor Philip Ebo Bonzi Simpson, to give his closing remarks. Thank you very much. We have been treated over the last little while to a very exciting lecture. Permit me, a lecturer and the Dean of Law, to suggest that for the translation of photosynthesis, <laughs> to Fanti, see me in chambers with consultation fee. <laughs> but it is indeed a serious matter not only to have the Bible translated into the vernacular and books for learning the various vernaculars in the vernacular, but perhaps economics and mathematics and statistics and history also has to be translated. I am suggesting for the consideration of all that the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration may be consulted to undertake that exercise for the translation of key textbooks into the different Ghanaian languages for learning. We know, of course, that also the term politician may probably have fallen into some unpopularity. 
Hopefully it should be redeemed. But until it is redeemed, politicians may consider themselves electoral agency development offices. <laughs> and for that reason, without in a sense partisan spectacles, with the sole agenda of national development at heart, we must undertake a serious discussion how to move our country forward. I wish to offer the services of the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration to facilitate this. And through this medium to extend an invitation to two individuals who may nominate someone to represent them, preferably to come themselves and to come accompanied with two or three persons. The invitation is extended personally to two individuals very closely associated with His Excellency John Evans Atamels. One of those two personalities was the Vice President of John Evans Atamels, who subsequently, upon his call to higher glory to serve in the courts above, became acting President of this Republic and subsequently, in his own right, became President of the Republic. I'm talking about no other than His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. The other invitation is also being extended personally to a contemporary of John Evans at Tamils at the University of Ghana. They were all contemporaries, one then reading economics, the other then reading law. They were friends. One subsequently pursued the study of law. They were all in those days interested in soccer and were playing in the soccer team at the University of Ghana. And subsequently, the other individual has become president of the Republic of Ghana. And I'm talking about no other person than His Excellency Nanado Dangwa Akufuado. <laughs> John Evans Atamils, interestingly, links these two. And as we are seeing that the national development agenda ought to be pursued in the interest of the nation, regardless of their different philosophical orientations, we are extending this invitation to both to be followed by a letter, and we hope both individuals will accept the invitation. It will be a closed door session between these two individuals and their two or three assistants in our presidential suite, and we do have one. <laughs> and it will be facilitated by the chairman, who I have not yet consulted, and I hope he will accept, of the National Development Planning Commission, who himself was once the rector of this institute. It is useful for the sake of national development from time to time to create a forum, closed door forum, for key players to meet, put the gloves aside, and talk. And fortunately, these two key players are friends. They used to be sitting in the Chamber of Parliament together, representing various constituencies. And I hope that the invitation of the Institute will be accepted. Because the other is not here, I will not ask the other one whether he has accepted. <laughs> but if he wishes to accept publicly, so be it. Permit me to also recognize a few more who I didn't see in the beginning. To the immediate left of the elder brother of my teacher are others. We do have a former Minister of National Security here, Honorable Ofito Tobi Kwache. We do have former Minister of Finance here, 
Honorable Kwame Pepra. I also recognize the elder brother of my former council chairman. I saw him when I was sitting there. The elder brother is here, and I recognize you. And my Cape Coast neighborhood colleagues, just in my backyard, who I've known for a few decades, the Yali twins, who are telling me to keep quiet. <laughs> Benin and Kakra, Yali. I do also recognize former Attorney General and Minister for Justice in this audience, Mrs. Marietta Bru, Pierpont, and her partner, a young man sporting the gray beard. Don't mind the beard, mind the skin. He's a young man, Tony Lita. If the other names are forgotten, I will appeal to Professor Akil Agbasoya, and uh, my teacher, Ankwamina, and uh, Tony Lita, to plead on my behalf for forgiveness, <laughs> for forgetting to mention other names. The presentation has touched on many things, starting with the true but sober and perhaps sordid story about a project in the holy city, not village, of Commenda. And as a point of contact, how many development projects of roads and schools and hospitals and the like since independence have we abandoned or discontinued because there has been a change of the guard. It is unacceptable, and we hope that there will be a new wind blowing where in the national interest and not for the sake of partisanship, some of these things will be taken seriously. Teaching indeed is the most difficult profession, but it is also the most beneficial profession and I suggest that it should be matched with it being the most remunerative <laughs> profession. When you are a for a pay teachers well. Indeed, development and education as a means to secure development shouldn't be retired. It should be operationalized. And there is a lot in the lecture we have heard, which suggests that as we look not only to the situation relative to education, to energy, to public works, to health, to gender, and the like, as a country, we should not pride ourselves that we are a middle-income country we should agree that, as the teachers will say, there is more room for improvement. With this, I thank you all very, very much for your attention. We hope that, like me, you have benefited from this presentation. And as I started, I will end extending an invitation to the present and the immediate past presidents individually to come to Gempa for a national closed door discussion in moving an agenda for national development. God bless our homeland Ghana and make our nation great and strong. Thank you.